going to get started. If it does seem a little warm in here to you tonight, it's because the air conditioning has taken a dive. So uh, we could have tried to go into the auditorium, but um, I, I don't know if that would have been a good fit for us. But uh, I want to just tell you, this is cooler than it was in Africa when I was teaching seven hours a day. So this is an hour long tonight, and uh, we'll survive the day. Turn the air conditioning on in the car, and you'll be all set. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? God, we just want to thank you for bringing us together tonight. And we pray, Lord, that as we study this uh, literary context, um, that we would really understand the significance of it, Lord, that it would really spur us on as we have the opportunity to understand this. Um, to a uh, deeper study of your word, uh, that we might get curious, Lord, about passages maybe that we haven't um, really understood in the past, and that, Lord, it might just spur us on to, to dig deeper. So I just pray that you bless each one who's here tonight, give thanks for uh, each one, and pray your blessing on our night in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, page number 149 in the good book. <laughs> so, I am in version 3. Tonight we're talking about literary context. Literary context is enormously important. Consider if someone said to you, go for it, what would you mean by that? You would wonder what they meant if they said uh, just those three words. Um, the question there you'll see in your notes, what does that mean? What are you trying to get across? You might ask a question like, go for what? Uh, because without the context, go for it can mean almost anything, can it? It can, it can just, the, the possibilities are endless for what that can become. And when we apply the scripture and we try to uh, interpret it, the context is so important because the context is going to determine the meaning. If you see that in your notes, you want to underline that. If you're using a highlighter, highlight it. It is in uh, uh, italics there. Context determines meaning. And uh, we found that out even in our discussion before the lesson started tonight. <laughs> that context uh, determines meaning. I uh, was telling the guys there that uh, I found a steak that was a prime steak instead of, you know, like choice that you get in most places. Prime is very expensive. And you can pay a lot for a prime steak. We were on vacation, and I found a steak, and it was only 20-some dollars. And I told my son, I said, I got this prime steak for 20-some dollars. And he said to me, I can't believe you paid 20-some dollars for a steak. And immediately, Ray was saying, oh, he's saying, basically, your son was saying, you're a cheapskate. You would never pay $29 for that steak. Versus saying, oh, I can't believe you actually found a prime steak in a restaurant that would only charge $29. You see, you can take it different ways, can't you? And that's why the context is so important. The context will determine the meaning. And so tonight's lesson is very valuable to us as we try to um, apply the laws of interpretation to the scriptures. Uh, because if we ignore the context... We can basically twist the scriptures into almost anything and truly create a, a scenario that really doesn't reflect the meaning of that context. We can uh, make the Bible say almost anything. Here's an example in your notes there of a young man who is uh, going to the Word of God to try to find some type of guidance in his romantic life. All right? So he's reading along. And he comes to 1 Corinthians 7.36, and it says they should get married. And he's got a love in his life, and he's wondered about getting married. And so he reads that one day, and he comes to the conclusion that God is trying to speak to him, and it must mean that he needs to get married. Then he happened to flip over to John 13.27, and it says there, what you are about to do, do quickly. And so he put those two things together, and he came up with the idea that what he needed to do was get married quickly. We, you know, we laugh about that. Can I just say, there are a lot of people who apply that same type of logic. I remember a, I remember a, a young fellow who was pastoring a church outside of Syracuse, and we'd gone uh, to Syracuse to church plant in 1984, and I bumped into this fellow, and the church was closing. He had a handful of people, and he was closing. And I remember asking him, 
you know, it's a shame that I said to, to see the church close. And if God has led you here, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's sad to see that. And I said, you know, how did you end up in Syracuse? And he said, well, he said, I was asking the Lord where I should go. And he said, one day I was reading the book of Acts, and they mentioned Syracuse. So he said, there it was. I knew that's right then where I should go. So he got on his car and headed up to Syracuse. Um, you know, this is, that's not that uncommon. It really is not. And people uh, will apply that. And so we have to be very wise. We have to be understanding. In fact, I would say this, that if you uh, look at the context, even of that 1 Corinthians passage, uh, what you're going to understand there is that uh, in that context, Paul is specifically saying that uh, if someone is, uh, uh, in order not to act dishonorably or be a fornicator, their passions are so strong, then he ought to marry. And that's why he's saying he's not saying they should get married. But then he goes on in verse 37, and he says, the man who settled down, uh, settled matter in his own heart, um, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will, made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man shall, uh, this man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. So unfortunately for this fellow's girlfriend, it's a good thing he didn't read that verse, or he would have never married her, right? <laughs> that is not how you go about seeking the will of God. Uh, it's very dangerous uh, to, to do that. And so we have to be careful. Not all of the examples, your notes say, are this ridiculous. But every violation of a context is a dangerous matter. And so we have to be reminded of that. Uh, there's nothing that, that um, you know, flippantly we want to try to, to do uh, and avoid the context because it can lead you into places where, uh, where it's really shaky ground. And you have to, to be wise to that. There's two things here, uh, two major kinds of context. One is the historical context that we talked about last week, and then this week, the literary context. And when you talk about literary context, we are going to talk about you know, what, is, what is the immediate context and how does it build out from there. Before we talk about that surrounding context, we should point out the fact that there is a genre that is unique, that is going to vary within scripture, in other words, the Bible is, is consistent of how many books of scripture is there? 63? 66. 66? Did you count Maccabees? Um, no, of course not. <laughs> so you got 39, 27, and you're, you're basically looking at that and you're saying, okay, within those books of scripture, how many genres can you think of? There are several different ones, isn't there? And you and I see these different genres all the time. Uh, literary genre can take on a lot of different expressions. When you stop and you think about it, uh, you can read, for instance, if you still would do it, you would read a newspaper. That's a particular genre. How you read the newspaper uh, is going to vary from the way you read a phone book. There are certain laws about reading a phone book, right? You're going to look it up. What, what's one of the laws about a phone book? Alphabetical. Alphabetical order. Are you going to apply that same thing to the newspaper? <laughs> no, because you have a sports page, you've got a, you know, the main news, you've got all of these different divisions within that. And so as we come to the scripture, we have to pay attention to the various genres that are included in scripture. Now, here's just a little uh, a rabbit trail here, but I just want to point this out. If you go to page number, go to page 251. Which edition? 251 in the third edition. Mm -hmm. What you'll see there is the New Testament letters. So New Testament letters, chapter 14. And this is going to talk about the letters that were written, and you have a list there, Romans and Corinthians, Galatians, and so forth. 227 for the rest of us. 227 for second edition? Okay. And the letters are going to basically uh, be 
they're going to behave in a particular way. There's going to, that's a specific genre there that you're going to apply certain rules to. When you go to the next section, chapter 15 in the third edition, it's the Gospels. Well, the Gospels, there's only how many Gospels? Four Gospels. All four of those Gospels have a particular genre. They are a particular genre. And you're going to study those um, according to the rules there. When you come to the book of Acts, it's important to note that Acts is a, a unique genre in and of itself. Uh, we often say that Acts is not necessarily normative. It's a transitional book. Is it an important book? Hugely important. But you wouldn't approach Acts with the same understanding that you would approach the Gospels or the Epistles. Um, in the Old Testament, you have narratives, you have poetry, you have the prophets, uh, you have wisdom literature, uh, you have all these different mechanisms. When you come to the book of Revelation, you have a whole other set of rules that you're going to have to play by in order to understand that genre. So genres are very, very important. Uh, top of page 151, going back to our, our chapter, the metaphor that many linguists use to describe literary genres is that of a game. And every single game has its own what? It has its own rules. You know, you can start playing Monopoly, and you can play similar rules to chess, maybe, and mess it all up, right? I mean, it just doesn't work if you apply different rules. I mean, when you're, when you're watching the World Cup, uh, you see the guys that are kicking the ball. There's only one guy that's allowed to pick up the ball, besides the referee. And that's the keeper, right? The keeper's going to be able to pick that ball up. Those are the rules that pertain to that. If all you're familiar with is American football, uh, you might question why in the world people are able to pick up that ball and, and run with it if they need to. So the rules are different. The same thing is true when you apply these literary aspects. And so stop and think about it. As you're going through these different segments of scripture, there are going to be different rules that are going to apply. So that's an important point. He asks in our notes, but how can we clarify the meaning of the ancient authors when they're not around to field our questions? In other words, how is it that we can find out what the rules are uh, when the authors aren't around to tell us? Now, I guess we can always write to Milton Bradley if we were playing a board game and find out what the rules are if we've somehow lost the rule sheet. But as Van Hooser puts it, what writing pulls asunder, author, context, text, reader, and genre joins together. So even though the author and, and I can't have a face-to-face -face conversation, we meet up in the text. And we're able to figure out a common set of rules. And the rules fit that particular genre. And that's an important aspect to, to stop and consider. All right, so that's, that's an important aspect here. So in this way, literary genre it's kind of a, a covenant of communication. You see that in that, that paragraph there. It's a fixed agreement between the author and the reader. Um, that's really important because we're saying that if you hold to the rules of the game, then the complaint that you hear people issue with regard to the scriptures, as in, oh, you know, the Bible, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. Is that true? So, the example of the fellow who says, I should get married, and I should do it quickly, he's getting the Bible to say something it doesn't say. You could take out of context enough of anything to make the Bible say what you want it to say. However, if you stick by the rules... The road narrows, the lines come into play, and there is a very selective meaning then to that scripture. And there is not nearly the wiggle room. So when someone comes and they offer a, uh, a, a complaint about the scripture, and they say, wow, you believe that Bible? Wow, uh, Bible, you can make that say anything you want it to say. That is really not true if you're applying the rules of the road uh, to interpretation. 
And whether they realize that or not, I, I couldn't say. But uh, people a lot of times don't understand the significance um, of these rules. You definitely want to remember that uh, when we pay attention to the rules, we have a much greater chance of reading the passage as it was intended. So let's start, let's stop and think about context. Let's think about context for a minute. If you were to take a passage of scripture, and you were to look at that passage of scripture, uh, there would be, uh, without a doubt, a, an immediate context. Right? There'd be an immediate context. So you have in your notes there Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So we would say, here's our context. It's Romans 12, 1 and 2. We would say that this is our immediate context. Two of the things that we need to explore as we stop and we think about the surrounding context, is where is the preceding context and where is the following context that makes up the discourse as a whole? Uh, we've got to try to figure that out if we're going to be able to hone in on this and put it in context. In other words, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, something that's very well known, and we're trying to fit that into the bigger picture, the bigger context. And so we're looking for the preceding context and the following context. And that's going to take a little bit of work on our part to try to determine exactly where do these passages fall. And so you can see here that the immediate context, and it just kind of ripples out from that. We have the passage. Here's the immediate context. There's the, rock, the rest of the bigger section. It all fits in a book. We're talking about the book of Romans, which fits into the New Testament. So it kind of ripples out from the center. Uh, he gives the example here of 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Do you recall its immediate context? Well, if you look at the context, there's verse 5 in the same way. You who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Now, the highest priority is the immediate context, but we certainly have to consider the rest of it. In your notes there, it says, a careful look at the immediate context of 1 Peter 5, 7, reveals that casting our cares on the Lord is strongly tied to humbling ourselves before him. The relationship grows stronger when we realize the word cast is actually a Greek participle, meaning casting. Participles are the, right, the coolest thing in Greek, because they give you a picture of, of time and, and uh, uh, continuity. Um, for instance, um, I'm trying to think of one. Uh, Matthew 28, uh, go ye in, into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Literally, that's a participle there, and it would be literally translated, while you are going. While you are going. And so it infers that as I'm living life, if I, I, you know, I'm getting up in the morning, I'm going to work, I'm doing all of these things. While I'm living my life, I need to be looking for the people that I can share faith with. And uh, it's not, it's not um, relegated to a group of officials in the church. It's, it's not relegated to Thursday night visitation. It's, not, it's, it's part of all of our lives. It's part of all of our duties to be regularly sharing our faith with people that we come across in life. And so 1 Peter 5, 7, it's interesting here because if you link up the idea of the humility with the casting your cares upon him, 
A person who is humble is not what? Proud. A proud person very rarely needs help. Have you ever noticed that? We all have pride, don't we? We all do. We all are proud people. We all tend to think that we have it covered ourselves. And usually when we run out of road, that's when we realize we need help and we call upon the name of the Lord. Um, the idea here is that the person, 1 Peter 5, 7, who is humbled first, will then in turn cast their care upon the Lord and ask God to be their help. All right? So when you put the context in there, do you see how it kind of shapes out and all of a sudden you can see what the meaning is? Is it a great verse standalone, casting all your care upon him who cares for you? Great verse. Does it mean more to you? Is it more substantive now that you know the context? Yeah. And that's where the, the scriptures come alive. And that's, unfortunately, the, the point that we miss. And so we, we get that verse. It's a blessing. Um, we might read the verse in our devotions, and there's nothing wrong with that. We read the verse in our devotions, and we say, that's a you know, great verse of scripture. But when we look at it in its context, and it takes on such a, a much more deeper and richer dynamic, that will tend to stick with us, I think, longer than just, just knowing just that verse. So hopefully um, you, you start to get the, the picture. And again, what I'm trying to do is motivate you to, to say, you know what, I'm going to spend a little time and look at the context as I'm, I'm looking at a verse. Uh, how many of you have a favorite verse? Do you have a favorite verse in the Bible? Maybe it's written down in your Bible. Maybe you've memorized it. Go back through this week and look at that favorite verse that you have and look at it in light of the surrounding context and see if you can add something to that. See if it somehow will, will come alive for you and, uh, and be a, a, a greater blessing. Dangers of disregarding literary context. Well, you've probably heard it said, you can make the Bible say anything you want, but that's only true if you disregard the literary context. So let's stop and think about this. Top of page 154, just because we approach scripture as evangelical Christians, does not make us immune to misrepresentations should we try, decide to neglect literary context. Now, this is where our pride comes in. Because oftentimes, we have made huge assumptions to Scripture, and we've really not stopped to, to think it all through. And he's going to give you three examples here in, in uh, your notes. And uh, you may be a little irritated, <laughs> uh, and, and it's fine. Um, I'm not trying to irritate you. I did not write this textbook, but I am sitting back quietly applauding in my heart <clears throat> and also being convicted. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you um, honestly where this is. Revelations 3.20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens this door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. How many are familiar with that verse of scripture? Okay. How many have heard it used in an evangelistic presentation? Okay. How many have personally used it in evangel? No, no. <laughs> it certainly looks like it's all about Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. If any man hears my voice, you know, come, put your faith in Jesus Christ and open that door. And Jesus Christ will come in and he will cleanse you from that sin. And so that's oftentimes the way that is applied, right? You look at that verse, however, in its context. And what does the context tell you? Go ahead and say it loudly. He's, I got a chair. he's standing at the door of the church. He, he's, yes, he's standing at the door of the church. What's the church's problem? Context. It's lukewarm. it's lukewarm. And what is he trying to say? He's saying, let me back in. He's saying, let me back in. If you repent of this lukewarmness, I will come in. There will be spiritual revival. Your sins will be forgiven. And it will be awesome again. Does that have anything to do with saving people? Salvation? <clears throat> well, not given the context not given the, the actual context. Could you apply it? Is there a theological principle there? Is there a theological principle so that you could say, well, there's a theological principle, so I'm really not totally bending the scripture? Mm -hmm. 
Here's another one. It's not in your book. Now, I'll use this out of context. You'll hear it on Sunday morning sometimes. All right? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You will hear me use that at times during the invitation. It is an invitation, true, but is it speaking to Christians or is that context speaking to unbelievers? It is clearly speaking to Christians. When we went through our study in 1 John, when I first came here in 2014, we, we, we looked at all of those things very, very clearly and we said this is directly related to Christians who are sinning. I know that I have an advocate with the Father, right? That's what it says right after that. And I can go to him in prayer, and I know that my sins are forgiven. Isn't that fabulous? Sure it is. Is there a theological principle that would also say that a lost person, if they confess their sins, he's faithful and just to forgive them too? Well, I believe that that's true. I believe that that's a theological principle. So even though I might say it, and I know in my back of my mind that the context is for Christians... I know I'm not violating because I'm looking at the biblical map and I understand that I'm not violating the scripture. But I should be also very, very aware of what I'm saying. And I need to be aware of the context. That's a very important point. Here's another one for you. Uh, and it's over there in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. All right. When is that usually evoked? Okay, it's a church discipline situation. That's oh, true. Oh, when you Sorry, but when, this when do we usually see this verse repeated in the church? Prayer meeting when? Prayer meeting when? Hardly anybody shows up. That's right. Hardly anybody comes to prayer meeting. We got three people, and you know the old deacon, and he pray, Oh, Lord, we're so thankful that you made a promise to us that we're two or three. I think there are two. Hey, are you going to the bathroom? Just wait a little bit here. You, 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 you got to wait. Uh, you know, because if we get this down to one, I guess Jesus is leaving with it. I mean, that's as silly as it is, though, isn't it? Because the truth of the matter is, it has um, nothing to do with Jesus being with two or three people. And I hear elders pray that prayer. I hear deacons pray that prayer. Today, I hear people praying that prayer. Oh, Lord, I'm just so thankful that you're here. Let me ask you, how many of you this week have prayed by yourself to God? I guess he didn't hear you then. <laughs> because if you need, if you need, I think this died. Did it? Yeah. Okay. So, so the problem is, is the way the context reads, right? That's the, the whole issue with that. Um, and this is why it tends to be misapplied. Because, uh, I don't know, I, I was several years into pastoral ministry before I actually went through this passage and knew what that meant. And forever I thought it meant where two or three are gathered, the Lord will hear our prayer. And I thought to myself, well, you know, that's kind of sketchy, but we'll just kind of move on, because I have no idea what this passage means. <clears throat> it wasn't until you look at the passage, you study the passage. Remember, he's talking about what is, what is bound on the earth is bound in heaven. What is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. We usually go, I have no idea what that means. Go to the next passage, right? I mean, that is tricky stuff. And here's what it means. You study the context. You start looking at it. And, and Paul makes that point. He says, you know, I'm looking at this, and it's part of a passage that deals with church discipline. Here's what it's saying. It's saying that the local church has the power to be able to make the... To, the local church, thank you, has the power, the authorization, the authority by God to make decisions here on the earth that are decisions that are bound in heaven. 
And so it's important for us to, to notice the context because otherwise we just completely blow that meaning. And what it's saying there is it doesn't matter if your church is a church of 5,000 people or if it's a church of 20 people, if you are determining that brother so-and-so, someone that has sinned and will not repent, <clears throat> needs to be removed from the church because of non-repentance, and that's the only thing ever, anybody's ever been removed from a church for, it's, the, it's not the sin that they did, it's the fact that they won't repent of it. Okay, understand that. If you ever hear of faith community churches is an acting church discipline, that is the only reason we've ever disciplined anyone from this church. It is because of non-repentance. We've gone to them, we've produced, here's the evidence. You have uh, several people making the decision and calling them for that brother or sister in Christ to repent. They wouldn't repent. Then the church takes the steps of Matthew 18. Here's the point. If the church makes a determination that this person is wrong, that they're walking away from the Lord and making the wrong decision, then that decision is authorized by God, and it is as if it's bound here, it's bound in heaven. Okay? That's what that's talking about. So where two, two or three are gathered, Christ is gathered there too, in the sense that now we have authority because we're not acting on our own. We're acting in the name of Jesus Christ. We're following his word. So, again, you look at these passages and you go, oh, okay, that starts to make a little bit more sense, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's why, again, we just want to spend the time uh, looking uh, very carefully at the context. Context is going to determine the meaning. Context is king uh, when it comes to all of this. There's another example there, 2 Timothy 2. We usually apply that to, uh, to sexual immorality. Um, it really according to the context there, really doesn't support that. It's actually Timothy who is dealing with uh, false teachers that are in the church, within the leadership of the church. And because of that, um, Paul is encouraging him uh, not to run away uh, and run into foolish discussions and arguments and theological novelties um, that would tend to mislead young pastors. He says, instead, run after righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So he's not, he's not telling uh, you know, Timothy that, listen, you're sexually immoral and you need to flee that. That's not the context. Again, you pull the context apart. You start to look. You look for things like, okay, where's my preceding context? Where is my following context? And, and that's a, it's a really good drill uh, to begin to do that. Now, it's going to take a lot of work to do something like that, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, when I was in seminary, they gave us Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. You know that verse? Yeah. Whatsoever man so that shall they also read, right? Yeah. Um, stop deceiving yourself. Whatsoever a man so that shall they also read. We had to look for the preceding context. That was the first thing you had to do in exegeting that verse of Scripture. Then you looked for the following context. And by the time you were all done, you understood the overall context and you could actually understand better the root meaning of a verse of scripture that is very commonly held in the back of our minds. And so that's very, very important. But it's harder work to try to develop that. There are different presentations and there are different ways that you can present things. Let me just say here uh, in your notes, you're going to see um, there are... Uh, really are, and I, he, he makes a note here, he says, there's three examples that illustrate the problem of ignoring the context. The way our Bibles have been divided into chapters and verses doesn't help much, uh, because sometimes as you go to try to determine where that context is, um, if you stop just because it's got a division here or a division there, you can actually miss the point. There's some things that we need to look a little closer at. So it becomes easier for us uh, whether we're teaching kids or teaching adults, it becomes easier for us to topically teach or preach. And that's your, your section there at the bottom of 155. A second danger associated with disregarding literary context is that of topical preaching. It's a valid approach to preaching when the various passages are understood in context and the overall message doesn't violate those individual contexts. How would you define, flipping the page over, how would you define uh, topical preaching versus text-driven preaching? 
Well, at the top you have John 10, thought number one, thought two, thought three, thought four. That's linear thinking that you're putting together all of those thoughts and you come to John's conclusion. Once you understand what John's conclusions are, based upon those thoughts, you can preach the sermon. So you're going to be teaching the lesson, or you're just, for your own benefit, you're just trying to understand the, the text here. You're going to look at it that way. Topical preaching is going to jump from one passage to the next. It's just, uh, it's just kind of all over the place. And uh, you're just going to randomly uh, take verses of Scripture. Uh, generally, generally speaking, topical messages are the most used method of preaching today. Topical messages are what you find. Uh, let's think of a topic. Are, are topical messages relevant? Are they, is there a place for topical messages? Okay. Give me an example of a topical message. Give me a, or a topic. Marriage. Marriage. All right. That's a great one. Marriage. Uh, so this Sunday I'm going to preach a message on, no, you're going to preach a message <laughs> <laughs> on marriage. All right. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to go about, you know, dealing with that, with that topic? Uh, there's a couple different ways you can do it. One way is you can just start, you know, pulling verses. Let's go to Genesis, and we'll go to Genesis 3, and, you know, leave and cleave passage. Um, we'll pop around uh, maybe Hebrews talking about some of the importance of, uh, you know, marriage, and the marriage bed's undefiled, and... Then maybe we'll end up somewhere else and we'll talk about, you know, be kind one to another. All right, in Ephesians. So, so we'll cover that and ten other things, you know, better to live on the rooftop of my home than, you know, better is soup than, you know, okay, you can go to jail. Right, so, so you pick all of these different passages and you start to deliver them. That, that's the diagram you have at the middle of page 156. Uh, where thought one goes to thought over here, three, and back to two, and back to four, and you're kind of all over the place just kind of picking from this passage and that passage. Is there a better way? Now, let me just say this. Is it necessary to preach on marriage at times? Yes. Is there a better way to do it than to go from one verse here, one verse here, one verse here? And what would that better way be? And it's right in what you're preaching about. It's like right in the Okay, that definitely plays into it, right? So if you're going through, for instance, we're going through Mark right now. Uh, are we going to deal with marriage in Mark? Quite possibly, right? There are a bunch of topics that are going to come up in the book of Mark. And you can just wait until you get through and, you know, you'll hit certain topics. The next series might be in Philippians and we'll hit those things. And the next one after that might be in Ruth and we'll deal with, you know, so you get the idea. But if you were going to speak this Sunday on marriage, what would be the best way for you to go about doing that? Can't from a passage like in the book of Ephesians. Exactly. <coughs> right. Bob said, go to a passage like in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, and develop it. That's what I would exactly agree with, and that's what my thinking was exactly. I would go to Ephesians chapter 5, and I would build out my message from that passage using the context that's there so that the meaning is conveyed honestly, all right? And so I think that's true about anything that you're dealing with, whether you're dealing with uh, giving, financial giving. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Corinthians, and I'm going to pull out that passage there, develop that, and speak on that, as opposed to doing this verse here, this verse here, this verse here, this verse here. And that's kind of the way we should start to think about even how to convey a lesson. So if you're going to do a topical lesson, go find a passage where the immediate context is dealing with the heartbeat of your topic, and then build it out from there, and you're going to be, without a doubt, very, very close to being right on. And you, again, you don't want to miss something. Don't forget those illustrations, right? I mean, there it is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Oh, I thought that was evangelistic. Uh, oh, two and three or more gathered. Oh, I thought Jesus just heard us when we prayed down by the boiler room on you know, Sunday morning. 
so, so we, we have to break free from that. And the only way we can do that is by careful study of the context. Now, the next section deals with how to identify the surrounding context. And uh, he gives the illustration here, it's pretty cool. He says, just imagine how a document would appear at the top of 157 if the sentences were not linked together to form a unified message. I heard an interesting story on the news the other night. The quarterback faded back to pass. Carbon buildup was keeping the carburetor from functioning properly. The two inch stakes were burned on the outside but raw on the inside. Ten foot high snowdrifts blocked the road. The grass needed mowing. The elevator raced to the top of the 100 story building in less than a minute, and the audience booed the poor performance. I said, what in the world? Those are all disjointed statements that have absolutely no context. And so let me ask you this do they have meaning? What does it say? Who knows? They're just all disjointed. I guess they have meaning in the sense that well, we would say that the author put them in a paragraph to make a point. <laughs> and that's about as far as you could go. We normally don't string randomly selected ideas together when we try to communicate. Normally our sentences have, are building on previous sentences that lead us to later sentences that produce ultimately a coherent message. And that's God's communication to us. Um, the parts of the Bible are all connected to form the whole. And so it's important for us to recognize that it all fits together. The Bible is a book of continuity. And it's very important that we don't miss that. It's safe to say that the most accurate interpretation of a passage is the one that best fits that passage's surrounding context. So we're going to look for that. He gives the illustration of Philemon. Philemon verses 4 through 7. And it's a, it's a good illustration. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. And if you were to look in your Bible, you may have divisions within Philippian, or Philemon that would break out, for instance, verses 1 through 3 is kind of reading. And then verses 4 through 7, um, it's going to talk more about the character of Philemon. And then you have the whole issue of Onesimus. And the Apostle Paul is appealing to Philemon. And he's appealing to him, according to this context, he's appealing to his character and pointing out that this is the right thing to do. So to grasp what Paul really means in verses 4 to 7, you need to examine what he says before and after verses 4 through 7. So you're going to go to it and you're going to say, okay, um, here's this verse of scripture, and I need to understand what this context is. So I'm going to try to figure out where it starts. And you'll notice here on page 159, there's a whole bunch of breakdowns according to Bible versions. You have the NIV, New King James, NASB, um, ESV, and it breaks out similarly for the first part. And then it breaks out a little differently after that. But you can see where the, the breakout sections are. This will help you to determine what the context is. It will help you identify the, the preceding context. There are different ways that you can uh, try to determine this context. Let me just say this. It's hard work. Okay? It, it, it's hard work. But if you get a good study Bible where there's some breaks, they usually are not going to be too far off. They're usually going to be fairly accurate. Uh, and you can see here, Philemon, everybody agrees one through three is a greeting. That's a piece of cake, right? That's a softball. Then four through seven, and then it changes. If you want to do the work yourself, look for changes in the text. And these are the things that we talked about at the beginning of our study, conjunctions, change of genre, change of the topic, changes in time, location, setting, grammatical changes, all of those types of things you're going to look for to try to determine this um, for yourself. But it's probably, if I were in your shoes, I think what I would be content with is, is looking at my study Bible and just saying, okay, this is where my study Bible breaks these things out. That's, that's good enough for me. And, and I would just hold right there, okay? Um, if you really want to, to dive deep, 
he's showing you here, this is how you would do it to dive deep. At each section, and you take Philemon and you take how it's broken out there, page 160 at the top, summarize the main idea in a dozen words or less. Uh, I think my study Bible said greeting over verses 1 through 3. That's a dozen words or less. It's only one word, right? That's good enough. <laughs> and then it said uh, uh, Philemon's love and faith was the headliner for verses 4 through 7. That's less than 12 words too. And then it said... Uh, for verses 8 through 16, an appeal for Onesimus. So you start to, to get the whole section, and you see how it begins to flow. It's all important that you are able to examine the context, because I like what he said earlier, I guess I, uh, I, I didn't read it when we were going through, but 75% of the time, you will get the right meaning if you take the time to look at the context. Just, just by simply looking at the context. It will tell you basically what you need to know. And that's, that's encouraging. Uh, again, I, I say you could go back to the Greek. You could look at main clauses. You could look at subordinate clauses. You can get very involved. Um, frankly, there's not a lot of pastors who get that involved. In fact, I, I came across a book. I have to tell you, I came across a book. It was a commentary, one of the New Testament books. And uh, the fellow is down at Southwestern Seminary. And he started an entire track uh, of education. It's a doctor of ministries degree in text-driven preaching. And uh, he developed uh, this book, uh, this commentary, and he developed the whole thing based on main clauses. And then he built out, he built out uh, the interpretation. Phenomenal. Best Best book in my library. I mean, it's just amazing the work that he's done there. I so appreciated that. Not only did he give me the, the preceding context, the following context, but he gave me what, here's what the main clauses are. And when we had Greek class, that's how you determine your preceding following context. You, you, you built that out based upon the main clauses because they always told us, you want to be able to teach and preach on the main clause, don't make the subordinate clause your main point. You know, because you're missing the, the whole meaning of the text if that's what you do. So you're going to slaughter it. Um, you might not say what's wrong. You might not say anything wrong. It might not be like that. But you'll miss the biblical math. So, so it's important for us to, to understand that. Now, if you haven't had the original language, don't get discouraged by that. There's so much good stuff out there. And your ability to just master the English Bible is your biggest key. Uh, that is the number one thing for a pastor, for that matter, uh, you know, to master the, the English Bible that we have in front of us um, is something that we should all uh, strive to do as followers of Christ. We want to know the, the meaning. So we're going to look at this text. We're going to look at that text clear, carefully. We're trying to figure out, okay, where does this begin? Where does this, this end? And, and try to get that dividing point. And it's, it's really kind of key. But don't lose sleep if you miss it by a little bit. You'll, you'll get it. You'll, you'll get it. Take, the assignment is for this week is to take your favorite verse and, and go back through and look at the context that it fits in. Yeah. And try to identify the preceding and following context of that verse of Scripture. Okay? And um, hopefully it will it'll just uh, be a blessing to you as you have the opportunity uh, to do that. Well, number three there in your notes, page 160. Explain how your particular passage relates to the surrounding sections. Once you can see the flow of thought, try to see how it fits in. If you don't do anything else besides read what comes before and what comes after, you will eliminate about 75% of all interpretive mistakes. That's pretty good. That's a good motivation. The heart of identifying the surrounding context is observing how your section relates to what comes before it and what comes after it. So, again, he goes on and he'll explain more about Philemon. And you can take time to, to do that um, as an exercise if you like to do that. Conclusion, we study literary context because the interpretation that best fits the context is the most valid interpretation. And again, we don't want to disregard it. We can force the Bible to say something that it doesn't say if we do that. So we're looking for, people are seeking time-tested answers to problems that are staring them in the face Answers that contemporary culture simply cannot supply. 
And when we take our literary context seriously, we're saying we want to hear what God is trying to say to us. Isn't that the key? You know, I was just reading, and I, I was telling Karen before we came over here, I was just reading about um, some of the different styles of preaching. There's, there's basically three different ways um, uh, preaching goes. One is the topical points here, points everywhere. The other is your text-driven preaching or expository preaching. A lot of people will talk about expository preaching. Can I just say that expository preaching does not mean you go verse by verse? Okay? So people think, oh yeah, I'm expository because I go verse by verse. Well, it's a good place to go, I guess, but that's not truly what expository preaching is. Then there's textual preaching. Textual preaching means you have a text, but you don't get all your main points out of that text. You might dive over, you know, you're going to do, here's an example. We're going to do the message on marriage this Sunday. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that says. But then I'm going to go over to Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to end up over here. I'm going to end up over here. That's a textual message. Um, there's a time and place for every style of preaching, without a doubt. Um, but you have to be very careful because with a textual message as well as a topical message, you can miss the context and you can miss the meaning of the passage because of that. Okay, it's been interesting because I was reading this one fellow who was writing. He said, I've never really done expository preaching. I've always done topical preaching. But he said, the problem is, in today's day and age, I'm running into so much resistance from the people in the pews as I'm preaching. People have issues with things that they never had issues with before. And he said, you have to be very, very careful that you don't offer opinions. If you don't go off and say, well, you know, this is what I believe about this or whatever. He said, I am starting to adopt expository preaching because I'm in the word of God. And if people come and they question what I'm saying, I have to be able to go back, put my finger on the passage and say, your disagreement is not with me, it's with God's word. And that's a good thing. I'm glad that we're driven to that. That's a, that's a positive thing. Um, because I, I find the same thing to be true. I, I find people will oftentimes question, um, even if I use a personal illustration, mm -hmm. I'm not even using it as a teaching point, they get mad. And they're like, well, what, you know. And it's like, you know, it's my experience. I'm sorry. I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's how I grew up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. And what we have to be on is the most really, really firm ground. Uh, and especially, and even in dealing, uh, talking to my kids, talking uh, to my son, you know, we talk about biblical issues and different things. The millennials want to see uh, exactly what this textbook is saying there. People are seeking time-tested answers to problems. And they don't want to hear what your opinion is if you can't support it in the scripture. Right? So that's very, very important. Now, what I'm finding is interesting is, as I explain to people who are millennials especially, here's what the Bible says. Um, I just simply say, this is what the Bible says. Now you have to deal with it. If you don't like what it says and you're going to try to change its meaning, now please explain to me how you're going to do that. This is what it says. There are a whole lot, can I just say, there are a whole lot of prickly verses of Scripture that run totally countercultural. And it is not my burden to try to explain it to you in a way that appeases your culture. If you want to believe something different than what the Bible says, you tell me how you got that idea. You figure it out. You apply. And that really is, uh, is, is honestly, I think, where we are today. I mean, we, that, that's right where we are. And uh, you just got to stand there and say, well, okay, here's what the scripture says. And here's what it says within the context. And let God deal with their hearts, right? That, that's true for all of us, isn't it? It's true for all of us. God, you just have to deal with my heart. Um, I've enjoyed every verse I've ever read in Scripture, but I find that some are very convicting. <laughs> some, some are not that pleasant. <laughs> but I realize that, uh, you know, I have a spiritual need, and uh, the Holy Spirit is, is pointing his finger at me, and then I have to deal with the truth of that passage, right? I have to deal with it. And I have the option, I can try to explain it away, I can try to refit it into the culture and, 
and try to make it say something maybe that wasn't intended. But at the end of the day, I have to come face to face with that. And uh, we want to be able to say to the world today, here are answers that will help you. Here's the answers that you need. And this is what the scripture says. This is what the scripture means. And we're arriving at it by virtue of looking at the whole context. So a lot to this. Uh, definitely, I, I think it's good we're done because this has been a heavy one. And it's good for you to, to let it ricochet around in your heart and uh, mind and just, just process it through. Don't forget what your assignment is, right? I think you'll like it. I think it'll be fun. OK? Any questions? Just a little comment. Um, careful observation is a major tool in every scientific discipline. And I, the Word of God is it's more marvelous than the body that God created for me. Nothing more important than that word. So careful observation um, is so valuable. Yeah. And that, that's why our second lesson was focusing on sentences. And we said the first thing we want to do is we want to focus on what the Bible says. Just what it says. And that means a careful observation. It means going over it with great detail, not spinning through it like we've you know, read it a thousand times and we just assume we know what it says. But carefully looking at it. Carefully looking at the, the paragraphs. Carefully looking at the discourse. And then transferring what we learned early during that interpretive journey, transferring those things that we talked about to this now, to say, OK, we're looking for the context. We're looking for the proceeding and, and following. And again, remember, you have those um, chapters that we studied earlier. You can go back through those. Even, even tonight, if you sit down with your favorite verse and you're trying to figure out the context tonight before you go to bed, go to those early chapters and look at all of those different literary devices that play into it. Repetition, numbers, all those different components. Because they will help you. If you see them there, they'll help you understand where that context falls. So if you see the word therefore, therefore, da da da, da that's, a, that's usually a, a, a dividing line okay, for context. So you just kind of put that back in your mind. Oh, OK, yeah. If I see the word therefore, that Usually, okay, and, and there are things like that that you studied already that hopefully you, you'll recall as you look for this context. Good, good, good. Anybody else? We're gonna have a word of prayer. You can get your air conditioned car. <laughs> it wasn't too bad, was it? It's starting to get a little hot now. But yeah, let's pray. Father God, we want to just thank you for the supreme value of the word. Uh, you had given to us, Lord, uh, a book that's supernaturally inspired by you. And Father, we know that every single word that you gave to those who, who wrote down what you put in their heart is important. So help us, Father, as we seek to understand the meaning. Lord, help us to look beyond uh, the immediate text and understand uh, how it fits into all of the portions around it. Uh, Father, it's our desire to know what the scripture truly says so that it helps us in our walk with you, but also, Father, so that we can teach and encourage others. So bless us, Lord, in this endeavor, I pray, and give us just a great rest of this week. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, just an announcement here just before you run. No, we don't meet next week. It is the 4th of July. The week after that, is UW Sports Ministry. We have five nights of that, Monday through Friday. So the next two Wednesday nights, um, you can come here, but there won't be much happening right here in this room unless the UW kids are right here. But uh, we'll resume in three weeks, and uh, looking forward to that. We are graduating from this section into the next section where we start talking about, talking about levels of meaning and all kinds of stuff. It's just, it's like a steak that just keeps getting juicier and juicier. You don't want to miss that. So I'll see you in three weeks. <laughs>